I was mad at him, I was mad at her, and I was just handed a gift trapped means of complete and utter destructive revenge. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs, where they are created with fleeky visuals and artificial love. For this episode, hold on to your butt cheeks and grab some refreshments, cause it's a wild one. We start off with a woman whose ex-partner tries to misuse the legal system, forcing her partner to join her stupid game, by using the legal system in the right way. Followed by a story, about a bully that receives a bully beatdown that's worthy of Spartan standards. Next story is about a bullied child, who had enough and took matters into her own hand, leaving the bully with a form of, crippling depression. If you're one of the extra spicy viewers, you want to stick for the last one, because the principle of proportionality, is rejected and thrown out of the window. So much so, that it has to be emphasized that the final act in this story, is not saluted by royal AI. Before we start, do the following to the like button, when it's storming outside, act chivalrous, by leaving with the promise that you'll enter the car first, so you can unlock the car for the like button from within the car. But when it actually reaches this point, pretend the door mechanism isn't working anymore, leaving the like button to face the rain in total despair, until it's soaking wet. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. The following story is told from a woman's perspective. File a false restraining order and threaten my life? Okay, let's dance partner. A few years ago, my now ex-wife filed a false restraining order against me. While we were getting a divorce, she was living with her boyfriend in another state. She had decided that a false restraining order was an excellent way to be awarded full possession of the vehicle I had purchased. We only had one key to the vehicle, and she was in possession of both the key and the vehicle. This is important later. I was exceedingly upset that she had knowingly filed a false restraining order, and upon being served, I immediately submitted my appeal and request for a hearing. I contacted my company, and had them print off all my Department of Transportation GPS logs, as well as company internal vehicle tracker data. I also printed out my personal GPS tracking data from the navigation system I was using. So not only did I have federally accredited logs showing exactly where I was, or more importantly, was not. I also had two very detailed systems information showing my exact speed, cardinal direction, and other pertinent information recorded in two minute and 30 seconds intervals. After I had compiled my entire body of evidence, I wrote a three page testimony to read to the judge to assist in explaining the entirety of the data, as well as present my side of the appeal. Almost 30 days passes, and I realize that upon adjournment of the case, and subsequent exiting of the courthouse, there is a chance I will be able to reach my vehicle before my ex does. With this in mind, I decided to contact the dealership from which I had purchased the vehicle, and acquired a second key. As we had only received one key when we purchased the vehicle, I knew she would not expect me to even be capable of driving away in it. So, fast forward a few days to the court date. I had driven across two states to attend this court judgment appeal. With all my paperwork, written testimony, and key to the vehicle. I arrive approximately four hours prior to the hearing time, and patiently wait for the magic moment to come. Bad news. It was extremely anticlimactic. As she was a no-show. The judge summarily ruled in my favor, and the restraining order was dismissed. The judge then asked if I had anything further for the court, and if not, I was free to go. So I very politely asked, Your Honor, it is my understanding that the restraining order is lifted? The judge confirmed this, but when I asked if that meant I could also retrieve my vehicle, the judge said that they were unable to give legal advice. When I was in the middle of apologizing, the judge told me to find a seat in the back of the courtroom so her secretary could provide me with a signed order of dismissal for the restraining order. In the case I were to be questioned by law enforcement for any reason regarding property or contact, it was best to have this documentation on me. As the cancellation of the order may not reach the police system until close of business that same day. The way in which the judge had worded her response was very clear in intent. She could not specifically tell me I was good to retrieve my vehicle, but she was taking the extra time to provide me with the paperwork that gave me a legal opportunity to retrieve my vehicle. So I sat down, and after nearly 10 minutes, the court official that was designated with the task of typing and printing the paperwork, got the judge's signature on it, and brought it to me. As I put it in my binder of other paperwork, and turned to leave the courtroom, the judge called out to me. Turning in mild surprise, I looked at her. Seeing her devious smile while saying, good luck. Now I had to formulate a plan. 
C. As the ex-wife had not been present for the court proceedings, neither was my vehicle. I had the address for her boyfriend's parents' house. As it was all over the initial restraining orders list of protected properties. I decided to utilize Uber to go to the address, and check if the vehicle was present at the address. Upon starting the Uber trip, I requested the Uber driver to wait for me at the address after dropping me off, giving her a quick summary of my circumstances and plan, to ensure that I had a witness present for the intended retrieval of my vehicle. Quite simply, to ensure that no false allegations of fictitious activities during the recovery of said vehicle would have a metaphorical leg to stand upon in court. The lady Uber driver was sympathetic to my cause and agreed. Even going so far as to give me her personal contact information in the event I required her for a future court appearance. Upon arrival at the address I had available, the vehicle was, indeed, present. The Uber lady waited until I had acquired the vehicle, left the premises, and she followed me about two miles to witness I had left the property completely, and then she went on her way. Bless that lady, she was a saint. So, I make it about a half hour away, and my phone rings. I answered it, and it was my ex-wife's boyfriend, and as you can imagine, he was not happy. He rambled off several vulgarities, and other random insulting comments which I entirely brushed off. Then he made a very large, and unintelligent mistake. He said if I ever see you again, here, or anywhere, I will blow your head off. Now, I'm a veteran. I don't take very kindly on threats to my life. I was upset at him, I was upset at her, and I was just handed a gift-wrapped means of complete and utter destructive revenge. I immediately hung up, and dialed 911 to report a verbal threat on my life. I headed to the parking lot of a local big box store to meet the responding officer, and ensured I didn't leave until I had a case number, attached written statement, and the reporting officer's identification information. I completed my trip to my home state, and the following Monday, this was all on a Friday, I went to my local courthouse and filed for an emergency restraining order. The judge that was available to hear my case for an emergency order was, interestingly enough, the same judge handling the divorce. She listened to the case I provided, reviewed the police report information I provided, and issued the requested emergency order. Doesn't sound like a good revenge, does it? Well, my ex-wife was living with the guy in his parents' basement. The restraining order issued by the judge protected myself, my property, and it seemed, it also protected my spouse. From him. See, we were still legally married, so I was legally able to list her as protected party. When the restraining order was served, he couldn't be within 600 feet of my, now, ex-wife. As she lived with him in his parents' basement, he wasn't the one that had to leave, she was. But, she no longer had my vehicle. She lost her brand new job. She wasn't able to get to school, so she failed her college course, but was stuck with the student loans for it anyway. She was now homeless, vehicle-less, jobless, kicked out of college for non-attendance, penniless, as she is atrociously bad with finances, and, to top it all off, she was nearly four months pregnant with his kid. For those individuals concerned about the ex's pregnancy and child, I was not aware she was pregnant at the time. To my knowledge, she was able to make it back to her home state and is living with her mother, raising the child to the best of her abilities. I've heard she has a total of three kids now, by three men. Moral of the story? Don't piss off a veteran. I don't like to play games. I will go out of my way to avoid playing games. I will bend over backwards to make sure I don't have to play games. But if you force my hand into playing aforementioned games, I will not be the one that loses the game. Which is something I told her verbatim on our third or fourth date. Guess she forgot, lol. Hold on to your butt cheeks for this one and grab some refreshments, because my story sounds crazy, but it is really my story. My story happened a good 9-10 to 10 years ago, when I was about 11. I had this horrible bully that frequently made sure that I would come home depressed or crying. The bully was younger than me, but what was worse, was that he was way taller than me, in the range of 5 feet 7 inches, while I was like 4 feet 11 inches. I was quite small for my age due to my parents who were also quite short. He was so tall because he had something that would make his bones grow faster, this will become very important later on in the story. The bully, who I will call Spaghetti for Bully Spaghetti, had bullied me in a variety of ways. He would frequently say things about my height and call me a disabled no life that didn't matter. He would also say very anti-Semitic things to me, since I'm Jewish, to the point he even threw a brick through one of my windows with a letter on it, saying things I can't share here. 
He even drew certain symbols on there for good measure I guess. This bullying had continued through the rest of the four years I was in that school, which made me extremely depressed. So much so, that at some point, it lowered my self-worth about my life drastically. Thinking back, I can only say I was very young and acting dumb. But one day around the final week of school, the bullying devolved into the worst event that happened to me. Spaghetti pushed me down a small fleet of stairs. When I fell down the stairs and reached the bottom, he ran down towards me and jumped on me. This hurt like hell and I started crying, he saw this as an opportunity to kick me while I was down. Luckily one of my friends found me on the ground. At the time it was so hard to breathe, that my friend picked me up and brought me to a teacher. The teacher, who I'll call Meatball for the bad teacher she was, you'll see why later, was shocked and then told my friend to get another teacher, specifically the one who used to be a nurse. At the end of the day, I felt better and was told that I had to stay after school in order to talk about what happened. I finished the rest of the day and then came back to Meatball. Spaghetti was also there. I thought I had finally the chance to expose him. When I sat down, I immediately started telling Meatball what this crazy spaghetti-shaped bully had done to me, but as soon as I told her, she called me the worst thing she could have at that point of time, a liar. This broke me and I realized she wasn't there to help me at all, so I became silent. In the end, she told us that we were both equally responsible for what happened, and that we both had to stay extra long after school, to help clean the school. This infuriated me. As soon as we walked out of that class, Spaghetti began making fun of me again. Saying things like, if you weren't so useless, this wouldn't have happened and people like you are cowards, so I knew you would tell the teacher. This was the final straw. Luckily for me, we were on the second floor of the building, which had two entry points, one with a collection of small stairs and one with one long stairway. Luckily for me, he decided to go to the long stairway. Revenge planned. When we eventually came to the stairway, I waited until he was already two steps down, this way I could easily Sparta nudge him. I stood ready and decided, that for this revenge, I had to do it like Leonidas, with a forceful Sparta boot. When I did, it felt incredible at first. But then I looked down all those stairs and saw that Spaghetti Boy looked like he was in extreme pain. I took it in, laughed and then decided to take the exit from the other stairway, so I would look less suspicious. Luckily for me, I saw the janitor on my way out, who later told Meatball that I couldn't have kicked Spaghetti from the stairway, because he saw me leave from the other stairway. The day after, I heard that Spaghetti was injured and I was questioned if I did it, but because the janitor was a witness and they eventually thought I had nothing to do with it. They just let me slip. Remember I told you he's so tall as a kid, because his bones grew faster? This condition he suffered from, made the bones grow in such a way that would make a fall potentially worse. Because of this and the Sparta boot, the aftermath was that his bones teared through his muscles, skin and nervous system when he fell and broke his legs. I only learned about this later, because after a few years, I heard that Spaghetti Boy is in therapy and that he broke both his legs, and that his nervous system in his legs is permanently damaged in a mysterious way while he was at school. The cherry on top, Meatball was the last teacher in the proximity of him when the incident happened, they looked at her as the responsible one for what had happened. She actually lost her job and had her teaching license removed. Nowadays, Spaghetti Boy uses a wheelchair and quit his academic path. Apparently, he is still trying to recover by doing a lot of therapy, but I know his family well enough that they can't pay for that forever. Even though it was never my intention to ruin his life and it just packed out like that, I still do not regret a single thing. I'll jump straight into it. About a month ago, this kid was being an absolute bully and jerk to me. His mom has recently gotten arrested, and he took his anger out on everyone, especially me. After a couple weeks of enduring this, it became too much. I lost it. I was tired of him verbally and physically bullying me, then sucking up to the teachers for safety or as retaliation. It boiled up to the point that I knew, it was time for revenge. Above his locker was one of the huge old AC systems, and I knew just the thing to do with it. On the night of a school basketball game, I went in with some tools and wire. The way it was set up was so when he slammed open his locker, it would pull down hard on the AC unit, which just so happened to be barely being supported. The next day, I get there and when I was going to the bathroom, I hear him scream. Everything went just as planned. The aftermath was pretty rough. It broke his legs and they had to get firefighters to come in with some of their equipment to get him out. This was due to the positioning of the AC unit and the locker on his body. Even better, his dad sued the school. Serves them right, for being blind to bullying. 
It really was the perfect crime, no cameras, proof, or fingerprints. He's still in a wheelchair today. Unlike most of the revenges in this place that are justified in some sense, I admit this one was very out of proportion. I am not proud of it, but I'm sharing this more as a way of venting than anything else. I am no writer, so this is long and may be tedious to some. Before I go into it, I want to emphasize that you should never do what I did, never try this at home. This happened about six years ago when I was halfway through my medicine degree. In my country, it is not as difficult to enter med school like in the USA. So I was very young, barely 20 years old at the time. Also, I had just recently came out of the closet. This is essential to the story, because I came out after my first ever male love interest, we will call him Bert, rejected me and basically outed me to the entire faculty in the process. But that in itself, is another story for another time. So, I was in the middle of a rough heartbreak when I met the third protagonist of this tale, my rebound, who I will call Ernie. Well, I had met him before, around the time I was trying to win over Bert, because the two of them hated each other. The sworn enemies kind of thing. So, it seemed natural that he came to me after the rejection. Bert and I had been very good friends and Ernie befriended me to get intel or something he could us against him. I was not mad about it, all the other way around, I was totally on board with his plan. The next two or three months. We spent a lot of time together, partly because we liked to gossip behind his back, and partly because we had hobbies in common. By the end of the semester, I came to realize I had fallen in love with Ernie. Sadly, this wasn't realistic. Ernie was technically straight, so I did not try anything romantic with him. I later found out he knew of my crush anyways, it seems I suck at hiding my feelings, and just decided to ignore it so as not to damage our relationship. But things suddenly changed. He started acting coldly and treating me bad every time I tried to reach him, and at one point he confronted me about my crush. Not only did he reject me, but started calling me a clingy such and such among other insults. Needless to say, our friendship was completely destroyed. Much later I found out that during this time, Ernie had been experimenting with another hetero-curious dude. When this guy decided he preferred his girlfriend over Ernie, he basically turned his anger against me. I admit, I can be quite irritating sometimes, so it seems this was what made me the perfect bullseye for his hate. So here I am, second heartbreak in least than six months, that is my luck. But still not mad enough to do something about it. Until I felt the backstabbing. I do not know how, when or why, but some weeks after our fallout, Ernie and Bert had become best friends forever, those you dream having when you are a kid. It was impossible seeing them apart while going around campus, at parties or even in class. Rumor has it, they were more than just friends, by this point Ernie was also out of the closet, as a bisexual man. And now I was the one being bullied. Soon enough, after they started hanging out, gossip about me became the norm. I became known as a crazy stalker and obsessed little man. Hey, even Gollum from Lord of the Rings seemed saner than I based on their stories. Additionally, any contact I had with Ernie or Bert ended in confrontation, to the point I had to actively evade them. That is when I decided to act, and what started only as a little prank, ended being something deadly. Time came for the birthday party of a friend we all three had in common and in which all our social groups will be reunited under one roof, she was a very popular girl. Me and my girl befriend, Clara, designed a little trick that would embarrass my two heartbreakers in front of everyone. It was very simple, we bought some love seeds which name starts with V, smashed them, and the plan was to mix some of it in their drinks to make them have the effects for the whole party to witness. Both loved using skinny pants, so we knew it would not only be uncomfortable, but very visible too. Clarification, as med students, we knew mixing alcohol with that stuff could have side effects, so we calculated a low dosage for our prank. This will be important later. Flash forward, we are all in the party and everything is going great. Too great I will say. I was very happy, and very drunk. I even thought of just letting my stupid plan go to waste and enjoy the party. But in the end, my bad judgment won. With Clara's help, it was not hard to slip it in my target's drinks while everyone was distracted. They sipped it whole. Minutes later, I could see the effects work on Bird as he was trying to get away from everybody on the dance floor while covering his privates. Fun fact, in Latin America we tend to dance very close to each other, so it was actually very funny seeing him trying to explain to every dance partner that he wasn't trying anything with them on the dance floor. You may be thinking. Such a lame way to get revenge, get out of here. But this is not the end. 
while Bert was suffering the funny side effects, Ernie was not that lucky. His friends were asking if anyone had some medicine for pain control, as he was having a moderate migraine. Remember the doses thing? Fearing I had screwed up and gave him more than what I wanted, I came to check on him, to see if he was alright. What happened next, was what led to the unfortunate events of the rest of the night. When I came close, he pushed me away very hard and threw me to the floor. He was drunk, aroused and had a headache, all things making him more aggressive than usual. He started insulting me in front of everyone, shouting that I was trying to take advantage of him while he was sick. If not for some of the people around us that stopped him on time, he would have hit me in the face. In that moment I snapped. I hated this guy, I hated him with all my heart, I hated that I was again the center of all the mean looks because of his dumb comments. I hated him so much, I decided something evil. Remember dear reader, I was drunk, under normal circumstances I would have not been able to pull this through. But the alcohol had weakened my moral compass and the anger had ended the job. I stood up, did not say a thing against him, and went looking for the first aid kit. I had been to my friend's house before, so I knew where it was, unlike Ernie's group. I took a pill and handed it to the first one of them I found, telling her it was medicine for the headache. She bought it and I just waited. In fact, what I had given the girl was a tablet of nitroglycerin I took from the kit. Which wouldn't help Ernie. In my country both look very similar so it's hard to tell them apart. Under normal circumstances, nitroglycerin is used for chest pain, but one of its main contraindications is its use with those love seeds, due to their potent combined effect. It can be lethal. I knew it, but at that moment I did not care. Soon enough, I heard the screams. Ernie had fallen to the floor due to a drastic blood pressure drop, and everyone was already calling rescue services. I will skip what happened in the next few hours. The party obviously ended, and Clara took me to her house. She was panicking, believing our prank had killed him and that we would go to jail for the rest of our lives. I was in my drunk super villain stupor and told her to calm down, assuring her we would be fine. I cannot stress enough how drunk I was, and the egotistical douchebag I can become when that happens. Meanwhile, Ernie was taken to the ER where they rehydrated him and were able to stabilize him. So no, no murder happened that night, although it was close. The next day, I finally recovered my senses while being hangover. Now afraid of my stupidity, I used every means I had to find out what happened to Ernie and, more importantly, if someone knew I was involved. Something essential here is that Ernie was taken to our college hospital due to our friend living close to the campus. As I was doing my practices there, it was easy seeing his medical record, so this is the reason I know what is coming next. In brief, Ernie had entered a state known as distributive shock due to the hypotension he suffered from the mix of the pills and alcohol. Luckily for everyone involved, he had arrived to the hospital just in time and nor his brain nor his heart suffered permanent damage. His kidney kind of had some acute problems but nothing serious. On the other hand, no one suspected a thing about me. The doctors assumed it had been a bad reaction to the excess of alcohol and maybe a recreational narcotic at the party, as this was not uncommon to happen. Some tests were done, but nothing came out and after he completely recovered, they just decided to let it be. The police were not involved. The aftermath of all this is very curious. I assume that due to his near-death experience. Ernie became more, let's say, docile. The rumors about me stopped and, with time, our animosity towards each other faded. Same with Bert. Later that year I found a boyfriend and my heart slowly recovered from what happened with the duo. This experience altogether, helped me realize I had some anger issues among other things, so I started going to psychological therapy to work on them and to prevent something similar ever happening again. Till this day no one knows what really happened that night and even my best friend just believes our prank backfired. Not that I actually intended to do this evil thing. And that is the end. Yeah, kind of heavy. If someone is wondering, I know how messed up all this was, and as I said before, I am not proud of it. I was very, very lucky nothing serious happened. On a side note, therapy helped me, so that's A+. Plus. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe to receive future episodes, and tickle the like button for good karma. Do you have any experiences surrounding this topic? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. And I'll be seeing you, in the next one.